Dr. Dr. Ali, it was a pleasure to hear you speak again, and Dr. Lacona, thank you again for coming. Um, the the question I have is in the last portion of your questions to Dr. Lacona, you were pressing a matter dealing with uh, Jesus' body, uh, his spirit, the resurrection, and and I'm wondering, are you um, trying to pull out something theological or in question relating to the res resurrection or rescue uh, question that we're talking about here tonight um, and, and what you were trying to get out of that as well as uh, Dr. Lacona, your response uh, is there any um, theological um, implications that we should be aware of from your response uh, I'm really curious if you guys can kind of hash that out Okay, that was a very clumsily, clumsily worded question. But I think what this guy is trying to ask is, okay, uh, Dr. Ali, I know you say the Quran says that Jesus didn't die. But besides that, besides the Quran saying so, what's the problem here? Is there like a, a deeper theological problem with the idea of Jesus dying? Uh, that of God, uh, the prophet, a prophet of God dying? Well, like, what's the big deal here? Yes. Uh, of course, Mike is very much interested in the history, uh, and I'm glad we discussed that for the most part. But, of course, it, it's, uh, there are theological connections, and Mike made that evident from the very inception of his opening presentation, if you recall. So, there are uh, theological problems with saying that Jesus died, and those problems are avoided by saying that God rescued and saved Jesus, as I have outlined. What are the problems? Now, if you say that God uh, had Jesus die, then they, that, that gives rise to what we know now to be Christian theology. And many Christians are now questioning traditional theology. For example, Steve Chalk, who is known to be an evangelical scholar in the United, in the United Kingdom, has written a book entitled The Lost Teachings of Jesus. And in that book, he's cautioning his fellow evangelicals that they should not say that God had Jesus die so that that would appease the, the, the wrath of God, which has been a common way in the Middle Ages to speak about Jesus' death. He says because this would make it, it, it appear like cosmic child abuse. Yeah, uh, I, I talk to a lot of liberal, progressive type Christians on Facebook. I'm in a group. Remember that group I talked about uh, wrestling with the disturbing parts of the Old Testament? And a lot of them there are are the type of people that Dr. Shabir Ali is, is talking about. Christians who are really uncomfortable with the idea that the Heavenly Father had to kill his own son in order for um, salvation to happen. Or the idea that who owns the earth? According to the New Testament, the earth and its inhabitants are of the domain of Satan, of Lucifer. And so in order for, um, I forget, the, is it John, First John? First John, it says that um, the whole world is under the dominion or under the power of the evil one. And so some Christians, their theology says that Jesus Christ was paid as a ransom, that Yahweh, God, had to actually take out his wallet and, and pay G, uh, Satan off. But it wasn't actually literal money that he, he had to pay off. It says, here's my boy. Look at him. He's strong. He's six foot three. He's, he's, he's strong like ox and smart like tractor. <laughs> I just said Jesus was smart as a tractor. Um, and so, uh, but a lot of Christians are very uncomfortable with that whole idea of Jesus being a ransom or Jesus um, being a, um, a sacrifice of that sort to pay off uh, a debt. Um, and so these types of progressive Christians are moving towards that. Jesus was an example of overcoming death, of submitting himself and conquering death in that way through pacifism and so forth. The father using the son for his own purposes to get rid of his own anger. And uh, we find that there are problems like this. Now, uh, of course, that there are other related problems. Yeah, I remember you, humble thinker. Good to see you here. Like with the Trinity, because if you say that uh, only God can die for your sins, uh, and therefore God had to come down and die. And then in the final analysis, we find out that it's not God who actually died. It's just the human body that was prepared for him here on earth that he associated with in some way. And then he left that human body just like the clothes we wear. We put it on, we take it off, he goes back to his heavenly body. So these are deep theological problems and we escape from them. Yeah, so, you know, it's so interesting listening to a Muslim talk about this. It's like, okay, what's the big deal if Jesus never really died spiritually 
because a lot of Christians believe that you can't even, you can't kill the spirit. So what's the big deal just killing this fleshy body part that God inhabited for uh, 30 years? Like, so what? Like, what's the power in that? Like, if, if how can a God conquer death just through killing a piece of meat, which is just our bodies, just a piece of meat? What's, what's so important about that? It, Jesus still lived, right? His spirit still lived. Or do Christians, do you believe that, that Jesus, his spirit actually died too? This uh, problem is to recognize that Luke's gospel does not present Jesus as dying for the sins of the world, but rather Luke has a martyr uh, theology where Jesus dies as a martyr. That's why in Luke's gospel it doesn't say, I've come as to give my life as a ransom for many. It says, I've come to serve. And so Luke's Gospel has in chapter 15 the story of the prodigal son, which means that when you sin, you turn back to God, he forgives you, nobody pays for your sins. This is amazing. I, you know, I, I've always known the story of the prodigal son. I was taught when I was a kid. Uh, I've heard that message spoken probably a dozen times in my lifetime. But I never really thought of it before until I heard um, a Muslim man say he, this is a great parable to show that Jesus' death, if he did die and rose from the dead, was useless. It was utterly useless if that parable holds merit. Why do I say that? Because it's an example of a father taking back his son after repentance. There was no payment needed, no sacrifice needed. The father was just hoping his son would turn from his evil ways and return to him. It's a beautiful picture of redemption. It's a beautiful pr picture of, I could, as a father, I can just, I can think about it and I can weep and think, oh, if my son was to hurt me and the family and so forth and, and go and hurt himself and live a certain lifestyle that was damaging to him and others. And, and then he turns from those ways and he comes back to his family. I would have open arms. I wouldn't say, okay, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did that. I need, before I can let you back in my house, I need payment, restitution for this. No, I would say, thank you that you came back to your family, that you came back to us, and that you're, you've turned your life around. It's a perfect story of how the God of the Old Testament, at least, does not require a sacrifice for forgiveness of sins. And if that's true, that Yahweh can forgive without a sacrifice, without a blood sacrifice, then the death of Jesus in this theology, where you need a payment, is kaput. Jesus died for nothing. <laughs>